Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome back to Uncommon Sense. I'm Junior Doan and I'm thrilled you're tuning in because my guest today is Bob Friedman, a former Chief Financial Officer and partner of Goldman Sachs and head of a, a, <laughs> a few other investment vehicles as well as a funder of scholarships. So welcome Bob. Now, now tell me, what, it, what does actually a Chief Financial Officer do or is responsible for? Well, you have to keep in mind that when I was Chief Financial Officer at Goldman Sachs, it was a different company than it is today. Today it's a, uh, uh, I don't know how many billion dollar uh, company, but when I joined it, it was uh, 1967, and the capital of the firm was something like $25 million, and maybe there were 700 people in the firm. So uh, today there are, uh, I think, 30,000 people and the capital is, as I say, well into the billions. Now, during the period I was there, uh, from 68 through the time that they went public in 1999, uh, there was tremendous growth. And the period of time in particular that I was chief financial officer, I was responsible for managing the risk uh, of, the, of the company as well as all the financial affairs, bank relationships, uh, making sure that uh, uh, there was appropriate controls throughout the firm and making sure we didn't get into any trouble. Now, we, we have all seen what happened in 2008 to many financial institutions. Uh, so the, you can see how important it is to have risk controls and have good financial management. And the chief financial officer uh, assumed that role. And uh, as I say, it was a period of very high growth. And uh, during, that, during that time, that weighed heavily on my shoulders, and, and uh, uh, I was a member of the management committee, and, uh, and my partners, uh, who by the way, at that time, when I became a partner, there were uh, no more than, I think, something like 40 partners. And there are many hundreds, perhaps thousands today. Wow. So uh, my partners would look to me, in many respects, uh, to feel comfortable that their capital uh, was intact, and I tried to do my best to see that that happened. There is much discussion of risk yes. <laughs> in in this industry. How does one, or how did you manage risk? What is involved with that? Well, what I try to do uh, was, you know, it's important. No one person uh, can assume that responsibility without the help of others. And so, what we had to do was build a group of people within my department that were smart and had the ability to uh, interact with the people that assumed the risk, the traders and, and the various uh, people in the producing areas. So those people who we not only had to have the, the actual controls, the financial controls, but we had to have people that were able to interact with the traders and understand what they were doing so that they could look at numbers and they, and they also could understand what the traders were doing and see that the and, and, and see that the controls and see that the, um, the risk management tools that we installed along with them uh, were being followed. And it gets com very, very complex as the, as the sophistication of the trading increased. So you had to have good people, you had to have good systems, and you had to have the cooperation of the people that were actually assuming the risk. They had to believe it was as strongly as you did as the financial uh, person I used to think of our, um, our department as the defense, the, the, the people that were assuming the risk were the offense. They were, they were producing profits, they were producing revenues. But as we know, if you, if you uh, go astray and you lose control, then uh, everything that you are producing goes out the, the door, out, out the window, whatever the metaphor. But the, the, uh, uh, so they had to be as interested in having those controls as we were in the defense. And, and for the most part, they were. How did you get your staff to um, get them to agree to that? 
Well, as my staff agreed easily, uh, the, the... No, I meant the offensive people, the you know, offensive or the go-go's well, types. That, a, a lot of that depended on the senior management of the firm. The, uh, I couldn't have done that alone, but the senior partners of the firm uh, that, uh, that relied on me had to promote that idea amongst the producers, too. They had a, uh, to give you an example, um, I, I remember one, I will not name the partner, but when he was a, a young man, um, he, he made the mistake of, 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 making, of doing something which was not illegal, but was, was extremely uh, frightening in terms of, of, of risk management. Um, and when we accost, uh, cons uh, dealt with him, he had to uh, make his case to the, to the uh, senior partner of the firm as to why he did what he did. He was, uh, he was uh, told in no uncertain terms that had he did, if he did it again, uh, he would no longer be a partner and no longer be a part of the firm. And he believed that, and so long as, as I knew and the people in the producing side knew that I and the defense had, the, had the, the back, if you will, of the senior people, they towed the line. And, they, uh, and, and so it was a combination of of them believing that uh, you were being reasonable and also knowing that you had the back of the senior people. And we did. And, and Goldman Sachs was among the very few firms. If you, if you study financial history going back to the 60s and 70s, you will find that many of the, of the names of Wall Street disappeared. If you look at the tombstones, yes. back in those years, you will see names that no longer appear. And these were great firms that lost control of their records, lost control of their business, and went out of business. And uh, uh, we were fortunate in having um, a very good people that thought and understood that controls and risk management was uh, a key to the growth of the firm. And so it was, a, it was a combination of effort, not only of myself, but of my partners and the senior partners in particular. So here you are, a young man, you know, um, working your way up, so to speak. Yeah. What did you have to learn uh, to be in that management position about managing people or getting along? Well, that's a very good question. And the, the, uh, you, you almost have to go back to from whence I came to get to Goldman Sachs. Okay, great. Uh, I was um, one of those people that, that grew up without much... Uh, in the way of, um, of uh, family background, if you will. My father was a, an, immig an immigrant to this country. Um, he, uh, and he, he worked for the government, never made any significant amount of money, but he had great, great character. And, uh, and he instilled in me a belief in doing things right and, uh, and being honest and having, and that your character meant everything. Um, but he couldn't instill in me um, the, uh, anything about what I might do in business mm. or any place else because it was not something he knew that much about. So uh, I had to learn uh, for myself. I graduated as, a, as an electrical engineer from the City College of New York, which was a free school at the time. It was a wonderful college with a great reputation. But I, when I graduated, I, I had, w with this degree, I had no idea of what I wanted to do. I went into the service for a while. I got out of the service. Um, and I then decided that the best, the best route for myself was to go to business school. And of course, I had to do it at night because I couldn't afford it. And I worked, and I, and I found myself looking for a job this is an interesting story, uh, Junior. The, the, the question of what one does and how one makes a living and how one succeeds seems easy to people that grow up with lots of role models. Hmm. I didn't know anybody in business, not a soul. And so how do I decide what to do? And uh, I'm dating my wife, and I, I often tell this story. I'm sitting around the... Uh, dinner table, and her aunt is there, and she had uh, relatives that were in the retail business. And her aunt said to me, you're an engineer, and um, I understand not much about engineering, she said, but I do know something about business. And from my experience, the people that really find their way in business are people that 
uh, study accounting. I said, really? Uh, why? And she said, well, accountants not only do um, important work for business, but very often they wind up working for the business that they're doing accounting for. And I thought that I, I never occurred to me. You have to think of what it's like to grow up without anybody mentoring you. Yes. Um, and I, so, it, it, not that that one comment led me to business school, but it made me think. I went to business school at night, I got enough accounting background, and I sought a job at the time in one of the big, at that time, big eight accounting firms. And the big eight accounting firms uh, at that time were looking for people that had a combination of a technical background, which I did in engineering, and also knew something about accounting. So I was a perfect candidate for them. And they hired me and I worked uh, uh, for them in their consulting area. And lo and behold, um, the, uh, one of my first clients was some place called Goldman Sachs. Hmm. And Goldman Sachs was in the midst of, as I mentioned before, this tremendous growth period where they were, um, where they were trying to control, get, hold on to their c control of their records. And they were having a great deal of trouble. And as I said, firms were going out of business. And I worked on that project along with them. And I was hired by the then senior partner hired me away from uh, the accounting firm, which is one of the biggest accounting firms, at not a, 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 not a number that was so attractive, but I knew what people made at Goldman Sachs. And that was the beginning. And so your question was how you, you gain the ability to manage and to, and to um, uh, lead people. But I think the background that I had, the background that I had uh, coming from the back, the, the, the schooling that I came from, coming from, uh, in a way, the school of hard knocks, even the background I had being in the Army uh, and leading other people and having interactions with other people of all different uh, backgrounds helped me when I got to Goldman Sachs, helped me not only in, in my technical background and my training helped me in an academic sense, but in terms of dealing with people the various experiences that you had, uh, even the summer jobs that I had, or the or, or basic training, or uh, so many, even as an accountant, you worked in many different industries. So you saw different kinds of people, different kinds of businesses, and, and you met uh, different human beings. And all that helped you when you were put in charge of actually leading people and actually making them uh, do the right thing and do it in a way that, that, uh, uh, that reflected well on the firm. Did you have to uh, do anything different in terms of management, whether the, the person you're talking to was more introverted or mild-mannered versus some of the more boisterous or hard-charging types? Yeah, every, exactly. Every, everybody responds differently uh, to motivation. You have to motivate people depending on their uh, individual personalities, and never, not everybody responds the same way. It helps, though. Um, one of the things that really helps, I, I go back to the fact that uh, good business, um, good results from business comes from having a good, solid, what we call tone at the top. Uh, what is it called? Tone at the top. Tone at the top, okay. So uh, in the 70s, the, the senior partner of the firm, uh, a fellow by the name of John Whitehead, who just passed away last year, wonderful man, great leader, one night went home and worked over the weekend and developed a set of uh, what he called business principles for Goldman Sachs that it was, it was approved by the management committee and sent out to all the employees, including those that worked for me and everybody else. And it really, if you read those principles, it said, this, this is what the firm expects of you. This is the way we want our people, no matter what they did, whether they worked in the mailroom or whether they were a, a senior trader, uh, to think of when they think of Goldman Sachs. And there were such things on there as one of the principles I always remember is, our assets are people, capital, and reputation. And if any of those are ever lost, the last is the most difficult to regain. Mm -hmm. Reputation. You can't lose your reputation. It just, you can't, 
it's very difficult to get it back, if not impossible. So when you had, uh, when you asked me how you motivate people, well, if they read those principles and they know that's what the firm expects of them, then it's much easier for you as an individual manager of people to, to have them cooperate and have them uh, uh, do what, do your bidding. Uh, and that was very important. And at that time, it was those principles were uh, something that now perhaps every company does that. But at that time, uh, what we did was quite unique. Tone at the top. Tone Love at it. the top. Tone at the top is, is so important. I it, bet that was one busy job. So there must have been a lot of stress. Yes, there was. How did you find the stress and how to live with it? Because on one hand, stress is exciting, you know? I mean, it's, you know, it's yep. moving, it's action. Yep. On the other hand, there can be maybe too much that wears you out. Well, I have to give a certain great amount of credit uh, to my wife, just a wonderful partner. Uh, not that she understood the business in particular, or tried to, but she understood me. <laughs> and she could, uh, and, th and there were times when the stress was unbelievable. And, and I didn't know that I, could, uh, that I could handle it. And I often thought about, about uh, uh, finding a way out of that stress. But she would calm me down and, and her uncle who was, a, who, was, who was a dentist by, by uh, training, uh, was also a pretty wise person. He would, he would observe us, he knew us pretty, pretty well, and uh, he, he would say that she was my Valium. Your what? Valium, Valium. Oh, Valium. Hmm. And, and it was true, and she still is. I mean, she, she kind of uh, understands me well enough to know uh, so when the people say, you know, behind uh, a certain success is, 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 is a spouse, uh, they're right. It, uh, how, how was she your value? If she, you came home stressed and agitated, she, how do, Because I would talk to her and she would cut through whatever it was that was, that was uh, driving me crazy and make it seem fine. You know, somehow she would... She would uh, she, she, in, in those discussions, and we would try to have dinner together as often as possible, um, uh, she, would, she would understand enough about the situation to know that what, there's a Yiddish expression called mishigas. Mishigas means craziness. So she would understand enough about the situation to know that it, it was just mishigas for me. I was just, I was obsessing over something that was uh, when you when you think about it and when you talk about it, uh, not worth the anxiety, and she would convince me of that somehow. You uh, commented that uh, you really didn't have role models. You had sort of had to make them up, as it were, mm -hmm. or figure it out on the fly. Yeah. What did you decide, or have you decided, to teach your children that came out of your own experience? Well, when I say I didn't have role models, I meant that I didn't In the have business ro world. role models to follow with respect to a career. Yes. Uh, but, I, but I had role models uh, in terms of my parents uh, for in a couple of ways. One was character, and, um, and the other was how to deal with uh, uh, things that happen in life that, are, that we don't foresee. And I, and, <laughs> and I often think that um, my, my mother, because the most fortunate thing uh, that, that affected my life was something that didn't happen to me. What do you mean, what do I mean by that? What didn't happen to me uh, when I was uh, nine years old uh, and I had polio, what didn't happen to me was that I wasn't paralyzed from it. What did happen to my brother, who got polio two weeks before me, was that he was paralyzed from it. From he, 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 and to this day, walks with a full-length brace. And what did happen to my father the same year, the same year, same summer, was he had a brain tumor. So my mother had two children, has two children. My mother's still alive. She's going to be 101. Good for her. But she has two children and a, and a husband who unfortunately is no longer with us. 
all of whom, or each of whom, in the summer of 1950, came down with terrible disease, polio, and, and, and so just imagine a person having to deal with that all at once. And uh, so, but she did. She was able to deal with it. I was the most fortunate one in the family because I, although I spent two weeks in the hospital, I came out unscathed. My brother spent seven months in the hospital. My father, several months, and his face was disfigured after that. And their whole life was changed. You go from being a normal, forgetting about finances, yeah. just being a normal family and having normal relationships and to all of a sudden having to deal with um, a completely changed and very frightening situation. So uh, she not only, uh, sh so she dealt with that um, and she um, a and somehow overcame it. So I always think of it from her point of view. How mm -hmm. did she do that? I mean, because you, you, you know, our lives are what they are, but something like that happening in, in, uh, to, to, to you and yet getting through it and, and yet still so I, I think that it gives you a perspective on, uh, um, so when you talk about role models, yeah, I didn't have role models with respect to career or business, or, but I certainly had role models in terms of character, life. in terms of, how, of how, to, how to deal with life and, and the fact that, you know, as somebody once said, um, you know, we, 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 nobody gets through this life alive. <laughs> And nobody gets through this life without problems. So it's, uh, and, and you know, my, my mother is proof of that. My family is. How did you handle the approach to leaving Goldman Sachs and starting out for the rest of your life? That's a transition period for many. And did you, I'm a thoughtful person that you are, mm -hmm. what did you, what conversations did you have with yourself or others? That's a wonderful, wonderful question. You brought up the question of stress, and uh, the reality is that uh, at Goldman Sachs in those years, and I suspect it's not a lot different today, although I think it is in certain ways, the average age of a partner that went limited, which is what they call a retired partner, it becomes a limited partner, uh, was 49, hmm. believe it or not. Well, that, I was 50, so I was right in that, in that area. And I had thought about it for a very long time. And honestly, the person I discussed it most with was my son. So I knew I wanted to do it, but it was very hard to do. Very hard to give that up, to give up all the ego gratification and all the, the, the to say nothing of the financial rewards. Um, and, uh, and it took an awful lot of believing that it was right for you. When I say discussions with my son, my wife, and mostly with myself, and to do it. And, uh, and when I finally did it, uh, I, I tried, uh, I, I wasn't sure, um, actually my son gave me, because I talked to him a lot, he gave me something I still have, a dartboard. And on the dartboard it had other things we had talked about <laughs> that I might do. Right. And he gave me that as a, as a gift when I retired. I did none of those things. I, none of the things that were on the dartboard, none of the things I talked about that I wind up doing. Because you don't know your own mind until you actually live with it, live with that situation for a while. And it took me a few years of just trying to, you know, I did many things in the, in the not-for-profit world, um, and finally uh, I came to a view as to what I really wanted to do, uh, and the first of those things was going back to school. I went back to Columbia and as a student and, and, and got an MA in, in uh, American history, something I was always interested in, and at the same time we started uh, our business of, uh, uh, with your friend Peter Levy and, uh, and Ron Tauber of uh, of Sage Capital Management, which grew into a very significant business and later Harmony. But I always said at the time that I never wanted to make my future business anywhere near as single-minded as mm -hmm. my business was when I was at Goldman Sachs. That I had given up the single-mindedness of commercial interests 
Uh, I was never going to go back to that. And I w I've always been true to that, that, that I made the other aspects of my life, school, the reading, uh, my family, uh, more, at, at a much higher level of priority than, than it had been before. And I think I've been, I think I've been successful at that and true, and, and true to that. But mm -hmm. what did you have to learn doing SAGE and well, Harmony? Because there, that puts you in a different field. It's investment more. Correct. And uh, although I was, I was um, uh, in, in my job at Goldman Sachs, I started uh, Goldman Sachs Asset Management because we went into the money market uh, management to you. business. And it was... Uh, so I began to get much more involved in, in investment, but as I when, I, when I retired, I recognized that I, I needed to learn a whole different world. That there was much more to the investing world than I was exposed to. So I took that up as a study, and, and <laughs> one of my partners and I, uh, Jim Couts, who, who was an initial uh, partner at SAGE, uh, began to do it in a serious way. We worked with an NYU professor. Uh, we, we, we studied his philosophy of investing. We read a lot. Um, and, and we tried to put in at the same determination to uh, learning about investing that we, that we put into our previous careers at Goldman. And uh, we, 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 uh, we didn't take it for granted. And we came up, when we came up with the idea of SAGE, we thought that uh, hedge funds at the time was a something that people ought to have as a, uh, on a as a percentage of their of their capital, and uh, and so we went to we actually went to MIT and uh, to a class at MIT and we and we proposed just as, just as for us to learn how they thought about it and we and we came up with their ideas and we hired another NYU professor and we just spent time learning. It's so important that you are not in any endeavor, are not too arrogant about what you know and what you don't know. <laughs> you need to understand yourself enough to, know, to, to appreciate that there are many people that know more than you do. And if you're, in a, if you're in, as you point out correctly, a somewhat different field, you better have and gain a good understanding of it. So we when did you feel, that. we're almost at a time, but when did you feel you had studied enough to act? Well, I think it took me about five years from the time that we retired from Goldman Sachs uh, as an active partner until the time that we started SAGE. So I, I think it took that much time before I felt enough confidence and, uh, uh, and Jim felt enough confidence and we, we wound up uh, 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 working with Peter and Peter had a great deal of, uh, he had much more investing experience at the time uh, than we did. He had been, uh, a, he was the son of Gus Levy and he was a, a retired partner and an investor for a very long time. So that Thank helped. you, I'm so sorry to end this, so interesting. Well, we've learned a great deal here from Bob. First of all, <laughs> be lucky and have parents who teach you character and fortitude. Sure. Secondly, studies are very good and they prepare you. And sometimes randomness, like the ants suggesting, the CPA, can really be influential in, in, in the course of your life. And the, I like the idea of don't be arrogant about <laughs> what you know. But Bob is like a seeker. He wants to bring into his life a lot of things. And I encourage you to do that to um, favor family, favor character. Remember, tone's at the top, but the top stops, starts in here. So good luck and have a wonderful week. Thank you so very much for tuning in. To contact Junia, send her an email at info at juniadome.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, Go to www.juniordome.com. Thanks for joining us. See you next time for Uncommon Sense with Junior Doan. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.